One of Toronto's best kept secrets is hidden right behind me in this Leaside neighbourhood building complex. One of these office spaces is home to an ecumenical cooperative that is taking social justice to the next level. Providing financial assistance to community projects that are impacting Canada's social landscape, the Canadian Alternative Investment Cooperative, also known as CAKE, is giving a second chance to organizations that are struggling to find the resources they need to turn their dreams into reality. Stay with me to find out how CAKE makes this possible and who it is that's benefiting from it. You're coming to CAKE um, for other debt. When I joined CAKE, I, I wasn't aware that a social lender existed. I, I didn't realize that that was, that that was out there. I, my only experience was with banks and, and, and your traditional financing uh, vehicles and and um, so the, I thought it was wonderful that uh, I was able to you know bring my services to an organization that really aligned with my my social values I mean the idea for CAKE began I think in in the early 70s there's, there was a group of it was really with Catholic religious communities that were talking about how their investments um, at the time were not necessarily reflecting what their what their social values and what their mission in fact was and so they they started to think well how can how can we um, ensure that our investment is actually doing what we want it to do in the world we're a national cooperative and we have three uh, financing streams we provide mortgages to community-based organizations and that would be simply a food bank a shelter um, any place that really needs a building to provide their social service out of we have um, social enterprise financing, and that can cover a myriad of, of ventures. Um, one of the things would be community loan funds, which we're very supportive of because it allows us to trickle right down to the grassroots level because CAKE's structure is such that we cannot lend to individuals. So if we provide funds to a community loan fund, they in turn can provide loans to individuals and they can also have the added benefit of providing mentoring, uh, skills development, things that we just, we just don't have the resources to provide. And also within the social enterprise financing, we can support things like cooperatives, um, could be food cooperative, could be a fair trade cooperative, and any sort of social enterprise that would, uh, would um, provide uh, social benefit. And then finally, we have uh, we provide financing to social and affordable housing projects, and these would be larger scale projects that uh, we can play a role in, in getting housing built. Oh, the criteria for receiving the loans, well, it has to be um, as a social benefit, and it has to be viable. So there has to be a financial plan that that we can say, yes, this looks like it'll work. And if it doesn't look like it works, then we can work with them and try to get them up to a point where it can work. I think the ones I really like the best are the, the micro-lending projects. and uh, Most of them are in Quebec or down east. And uh, they lend small amounts of money to people to get small businesses going, and we can help fund them. And uh, then they lend the money out and get it back in. And, uh, it's, they don't have any trouble paying back our low interest rates. You know, it's interesting, one of the questions in our application form is, have you been turned down by a conventional lender? So it's clearly to make resources available for those who can't go to conventional lenders. Charities have a hard time going to conventional lenders. Um, so that's, so that's great to hear. So we're already, by kind of mainstream measures, taking a risk that that let's say the chartered banks may may or may not take. I think groups understand very clearly that the cake is special. That you know, people have made some very you know hard decisions to have this money available, and that if they are unable to pay it back or don't pay it back, it's not going to be available for the next group that comes. 
and ask for the resources. So there's a, there is a definitely kind of a, a moral or an ethical element to the, the relationship that Cake has with his borrowers. I've been so, so impressed with the dedication of our borrowers. I guess you could say maybe we only lend to people we feel are very dedicated to, but the thing, the, their dedication to their project and their idea, that's really often what gets Cake, um, cake on board. Uh, you know, we really are investing in the, in the people who come to us with, you know, a plan to build a new shelter or open up a food bank or, or whatever whatever the project is. So seeing that, that zeal, that enthusiasm, people kind of working on the edge of it's it's not a tried road for them. They're often, you know, trailblazers themselves and that can be very, very inspiring. It's just been good to to know that my community that I belong to and uh, and love has been able to help so many people. And so I can just smile and say, this is terrific. One of the trailblazing groups to benefit from a cake loan is the dedicated team behind the works of St. John the Compassionate Mission. Located on Broadview Avenue in Toronto's Queen East neighborhood, this mission, serving many of the city's homeless, approached Cake for a mortgage. This allowed them to purchase the building next door, which today houses Toronto's most sought-after baked goods. It started with a man named uh, Joe, who was a Hungarian baker, who had a donut shop next door to the mission in those days. Uh, Joe was an alcoholic, and he eventually lost his business, and he lost his family. Um, due to his addiction and he ended up living out of his car um, but because he had this connection to the mission he would come to the mission and he would bake bread there. Then Joe died a couple of years after that and there was this uh, always this talk around about starting some, something up again and, and there was also this equipment that Joe had left his old mixer so one day a group of us decided we would like to try to learn how to bake bread and we stuck with it and we started getting better at it and we our, our biggest break is that we have a connection to a community in France called Pain de Vie, Bread of Life um, and they have a number of communities around France that have uh, bakeries as part of their community that's their community work. The bakers there also came back a couple of times and taught us uh, how to turn our bakery into a French uh, style bread bakery, including giving us their recipes and, um, and that's how we started making you know, bread that was, you know, that has turned into some of the best bread in the city. Cake has been really important in supporting a small organization like this which has a hard time getting access to, to funding. Yeah, because they'll, they'll take a chance on supporting something that's maybe a little less solid than the banks would, would want, right? So they've, you know, they've really been crucial in allowing, one of the crucial pieces in allowing this to happen. The basic idea of the bakery was to give uh, work to people. Um, Father Roberto has had the vision always of having a place where people would work together, um, but also that they would work, that, you know, that it's not enough to give people a handout. So the bakery provides training opportunities and work experience to people who are on social assistance with the idea that some of those people will eventually come off social assistance, that they will um, have the capacity and the interest to work full time in the bakery and that's happened in a number of cases. In my family, we have, I have three older brothers and I'm the youngest. And my mom thought I couldn't find a job, and my mom keeps on repeating to me, find another job and stuff. The reason was, every time I had an application, right at the end I told them, oh, I'm sorry, but I have a learning disability. And the owner would say to me, I'll call you back in a week or so. I had not received a phone call, and I found out that they're not applying people that have certain problems. I can't read or write, but I can read recipes and stuff. My boss, Mark, he supported me, helped me around. We learned that when someone's starting to work, help them also. Just don't leave them out of there. 
St. John's Bakery has given many like Anna a second chance in life by applying the same virtue that continues to drive the mission next door. From its humble beginnings in a shopping mall space over 20 years ago, St. John's Mission has now found a permanent home. Since day one, Father Roberto and his team have opened their doors to the street and to the will of God, turning no one away. I really believe that the church is about life and that the worship really to be properly understood has to be understood within the context of a life and that's Monday to, to Sunday and not just Sunday. And so how to do that, I don't really know, you, you simply live it, you know. So we, well, when we rented the store and we opened up this place, we really had no idea of, of what adventure, what was the cost, what we would learn, you know. So it was an op but it was simply to place us to place us in a place where the door was open, and together to discover what does the gospel have to say to this person who is in pain or this person who is troubled or this person who is lost. You know, we serve about 3,000 meals per month. About 60 percent, I would say, are stable people. Are people that have a connection with us and um, either they come every day or they come once a month or they, they, they just connect it with us. And then there's about 40% who are purely transient, you know, who, who come through. And, um, but even those, I've, every once in a while, you know, I discover that somebody I don't remember even, you know, uh, will come back and say, don't you remember, you know, 10 years ago, I had lunch with you here, you know, and, and uh, you know, I still remember what you told me. Some days I don't feel to get out of bed in the winter, but I think, you know, I have a warm bed and they don't. So I'd come and I'd put coffee on and I'd boil eggs and have cereal and yogurt and bread. We always have bread. You know, some of them are really young and, you know, they could be my daughter or my son. Just because they do drugs or drink or whatever, they still need to eat. You know, how Christian can we be if we don't feed them? I go into chapel sometimes and, you know, some days you get stressed days, I go in there and just sit for a little while and everything sort of calms down and come out and I do my job. I bring my grandchildren here and they come into chapel with me sometimes and they just look around and say, oh, Jesus is in here and I go, yes. Contemplation is a fundamental human need that unless we pray, unless we're, we, we know how to, 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 to lose time with God, we won't know how to be with each other, you know, in a way that's truly present and truly gratuitous. Um, that, that, that the real question of our time is not necessarily that we need to do more, but that we no longer know how to be present to another. And so to learn to be just that, you know, to create a community where that is a value. God is not just in the chapel, but is that, that really people are affected just by being here. We always ask what's in a name, but what if we start asking what's in a cup of coffee? Fair trade, one of today's biggest trends, it's easy to find, but it's not always truly fair trade or very pleasing to the palate. For the residents of Guelph and surrounding area, the search for the perfect cup stops at Planet Bean. This worker cooperative providing delicious, organic, 100% fair trade coffee was able to tap into Cake's social enterprise fund, purchase a new roaster and expand its retail business. Here's the story. It started uh, about 20, 20 years ago as a formal organization. And the way it started was that there was a, a worker priest from Holland, uh, a man named Francisco van der Hoff. He was uh, in uh, Chile, and when the coup occurred in Chile, he left and was stationed in a very remote valley in Oaxaca, in the mountains of Mexico. And he found himself amongst uh, a group of very, very poor indigenous people and they were struggling, and they weren't treated very well by the, the sort of land-owning population. And uh, so Francisco found himself in a position where these people were his 
parishioners. And uh, he discovered that the one thing that they had that was of value was coffee. So they were growing coffee in the shade of the forests there. But they couldn't get a fair price because they would sell their coffee to uh, people who are derogatorily termed uh, coyotes. And coyotes are middlemen. And so the coyotes would obviously try to get the coffee for as cheap as humanly possible from these indigenous people, either through getting them into debt by lending the money when they, when they didn't have any, or even outright threatening them. And so what Francisco determined was that if he was able to find somebody who would buy this coffee directly and bring it to Europe, then he could pay them the full price. And so that's what he did. And then he also found a, a way of marketing it in, in, uh, in Holland as this idea of fair trade where when consumers bought the coffee, they were actually making a, and creating a direct link between them as consumers and the people who produced it. The formal fair trade market has these rules that it applies to producers. Things like you have to organize democratically in a co-op, preferably. You have to uh, have women participate in the management of the organization. You have to work towards ecological sustainability. You have to care about your community and invest in it. The cooperative principles enhanced by a few fair trade things where, where farmers are getting a fair price for their coffee. And that's why we've de decided to become a worker co-op because it's consistent from an ethical perspective with the values that our producers share in the South. It's about rethinking economic relationships both here and in the South so that we can create an economy that's based on equality and social justice. Cake was a key component of our capital raising uh, strategy. Key in a couple of ways. Key from a, a value base, because if you look at what Cake is about uh, and you look at the kind of investments that they aspire to make, we fit in very well. I mean, we're certainly not your uh, high-tech startup or anything like that. We have, we're grounded in social justice, which is what that fund is, is really supposed to promote. So by getting them to invest in us uh, from a value perspective, that made us feel, okay, well, we have a kindred spirit out there. We're not alone in trying to create these new alternative economic models. Uh, the second is just purely the capital component. They came in uh, as a major capital investor, and that made it more comfortable for other investors. In 2005, I visited the Café Femenino Cooperative in Peru, which is a group of women coffee producers, and I basically explored the, the uh, areas away from civilization, pretty high up in the mountains. Uh, some of the areas were very poverty-stricken, others were not. Uh, the difference between the fair trade communities and the non-fair trade communities was very noticeable. Mainly in, in the uh, attitudes of the people, uh, those that were living in the fair trade communities seemed to just enjoy their lives a little more. They seemed to be a little happier, where in, in other communities or even other producers that were not involved in fair trade, they, they almost seemed a little bitter even towards the fair trade producers. Café Femenino is a cooperative of about 750 women and they sort of formed an alliance because uh, typically in these countries men take control of all of the finances and things like that and even though some of these women actually own their land and they, they tend their crops and harvest and everything like this, the men would still take control of the money. So the women really had no choice in where that money was going and a lot of times the money wouldn't even make it home. Uh, we were one of the first companies to sign on with Cafe Femenino. As soon as we heard about the project we were interested. This is not charity. This is not uh, people making a donation. This is a business model and so just by paying these people a fair price they have completely transformed their communities. Uh, additional classrooms built and, and 20 new water supplies uh, created for villages and, and that they built new health centers and they, they invested in roads and infrastructure. So when folks come into Planet Bean, we want people to have an authentic relationship with the coffee, both in terms of its flavor, uh, in terms of its economics, and also we, the other thing is we want people to feel like they're, they've developed a personal relationship with the producer over time. So the images that we have in our, in our business are pictures of our producers. 
they're not marketing creations of a marketing company. They're, like they're not an idealized campesino. They're, these are the actual folks and we know their names and, and these are the projects that they're in and this is the kind of house they live in. And so that way when people develop an understanding, a more intimate understanding of uh, who it is that they're getting their product from, it makes it more difficult to not care. So that's an awful lot to ask for a taste of a cup of coffee, but I think that's essentially what we'd really like is for people to be wowed by the flavor and intrigued by the ethics. Tucked away in Toronto's Hillcrest Village is a resource and training centre for immigrants and refugees. In order to serve Toronto's growing community in a larger capacity, Skills for Change sought the help of CAKE when it came to funding much needed renovations and increasing its overall workspace. The CAKE loan was, was very important uh, to us um, because it enabled us. We own our property and obviously when you own a property there's an awful lot of responsibility that comes along with that and there's an awful lot of cost that goes into maintaining uh, the building and so the loan really enabled us to kind of enhance the capacity of the building which has been wonderful in terms of everybody's experience of the, of the organisation. I would describe Skills for Change as a place where immigrants and refugees can come to get the skills and information they need to work in the, um, in the community. And so specifically we offer language training courses, um, skills upgrading courses and employment preparation programs. And we particularly specialize in programs for internationally educated professionals. So for example, we have a program for teachers, we have a program for medical doctors, program for engineers, so it's quite specialized. We have some more general programs as well, but what we're sort of known for and what uh, is really the draw for people to Skills for Change is that we do have very tailored programs and we're successful at helping people get into jobs in their profession. We have about 10,000 clients a year. On average, our success rate is about 70% of people do find work in their field. Another people after three to six months. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a success rate that we're we're very happy with, and we're always looking at ways to to make sure that that 70% is 70%. That those are really good jobs that people are getting. That people are getting jobs in their field that really reflect their skills and ability. I started doing some volunteering for other organizations, but that's how I got to learn about Skills for Change and uh, about all the services and support that they provide to internationally skilled immigrants. So um, I was particularly interested in job search workshop, and that's what I attended. But yeah, the help I received was tremendous in many ways. Uh, they were holding a networking event here at Skills for Change, and I attended this event and I ended up uh, chatting with my future boss at the time, Jane Collingworth. I didn't know that she was going to, I didn't know who she was. We just ended up sitting next to each other and we got into a conversation and she said that they were looking for an assistant, so why don't I apply? And at that time I just started searching. So it took me three weeks altogether. I applied for the position and, and went for an interview and today I'm I am very happy to be a part of Skills for Change family. There's an individual called Erica Kuna. Probably in the 90s he came here initially and was part of uh, what we called um, our STIC program, which is Sector Terminology Information and Counseling. And he, his um, background, I believe, was in engineering, and so he was in our engineering program. And uh, he, through the program, and kind of got what he needed in terms of finding work and getting connected to an employer. He was matched up with a mentor. Mentoring is a very big piece of almost all of our programs. And he was successful and got, got a job in his field and was very happy. And he continued to stay in touch with the organization and eventually became a mentor himself. And a number of years back, he was nominated as the New Pioneer Award recipient uh, for a graduate. Um, the Graduate Award. So he's a really great example of somebody who came in as a client and basically was very successful but has never left. He's really stayed connected to the organization and has been recognized by the organization. And the whole idea behind New Pioneers was to, that it was really important for us to, to try to shape 
positively attitudes towards immigrants and refugees. You hear so many things in the news about difficulties that immigrants and refugees face and while it's very true, uh, we wanted to celebrate the success stories. There's not really a big distinction for me between, there isn't a distinction between who we are as staff and who we work with as clients and that I think is what makes us unique because there isn't, um, you sometimes hear about a kind of more traditional philanthropic kind of relationship where you have the helpers and the people being helped and although we do help people I think we do it in a way that is respectful um, and that isn't about, there's not a power differential like oh you know I'm the one who can help you, you poor suffering person, you. I mean, there isn't that kind of dynamic. And I think we've created a space here that really is a family. I mean, we often talk about the Skills for Change family and when we hire new people, the coordinator will send out an email and they always talk about, please help me welcome so-and-so to the Skills for Change family. And many of our staff um, are immigrants and refugees. I think that, that, that um, we really practice what we preach. Like We really believe our tagline is diversity at work and we really believe that because it works for us so beautifully. Thank you for watching another episode of Catholic Focus. If you have any questions about CAKE or its nationwide projects, please visit their website at caic.ca. And as always, we at Salt and Light love to hear from our viewers, so if you have any questions or comments or would like to purchase a copy of today's episode, please write to us at focus at saltandlighttv.org. I'm your host, Michelle Nuzzo. We'll see you next time.